Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome everyone to today's uh, program in the Rancho Bernardo Historical Society Speaker Series. I'm Vincent Rossi, the coordinator of the program, and I welcome you to the museum. And uh, first, I, I want to start off, I'm, I'm putting this all down, so I'm trying to be organized here. I have to start by asking everyone with uh, cell phones to either mute or turn off your phones, which I remembered to do before we got here. Because I caught myself in one of these earlier programs, I gave that announcement, and then all of a sudden... Anyway. Um, and I also just want to include. Oh. <laughs> yes. And uh, I also just want to mention that our, our next program on May be, uh, May the nineteenth, and we will have Mr. D. A. Mac McPherson, Executive Director of the San Diego Porcelain Carriage Foundation, and he will be talking about the great nineteen fifteen Point Loma road race. So that's an interesting mm -hmm. aspect that I. I hadn't even known there was a Horses Carriage Foundation, but they're an extensive organization. And, and they'll be talking about this important race that took place in uh, 1915. So keep, uh, put that in your program. And I also want to remind you that on the 28th of May, uh, the Society will be having our 13th annual Pancake Festival in, uh, at Webb Lake Park. And there are some flyers about that uh, around. That, and you can also check on the Society's website for further information. It's an annual event. Uh, we uh, offer a free breakfast to veterans and active military and children under three. Uh, everyone else, there's uh, tickets are eight dollars, but it's always a good meal provided with the help of the uh, local Columbus clubs. And we uh, help to honor, and then we all participate in the veterans memorial ceremony afterwards. So keep your uh, calendars free for that event too. Uh, and now I'd like to uh, introduce our speaker for today. Douglas Mengers is a 20-year resident of San Diego. His passion for San Diego history was sparked when he moved into a 1920 craftsman home in the Mission Hills neighborhood and began researching the family who built the house. And I've done a bit of that myself as a family history researcher, and that's fun. He has since lived in several of San Diego's old, quote, trolley neighborhoods. Doug has degrees in anthropology, archaeology, and history from the University of California at San Diego and San Diego State University. He's a senior archaeologist and historian with the Carlsbad-based environmental consulting firm Pangis. Thank you. And he's listed on the Register of Professional Archaeologists and the Director of Professionals in Public History. And he serves on the Board of Directors of the San Diego County Archaeological Society. Mr. Mengers has presented at archaeological conferences on subjects including historical glass artifacts, Spanish-era irrigation systems, and marine archaeology. His historical research focuses on Southern California transportation infrastructure, consumerism, and migration patterns of the late 19th to early 20th centuries. And I uh, hadn't really known that there was an archaeology of mass transit, and I'm looking forward to hearing more about it today. So without further ado, Mr. Douglas Mengers. All right, thank you all for coming out today. Uh, so uh, a little bit about myself, as you might have just heard. So uh, I stayed in school. I'm listed on the Register of Professional Archaeologists and on the Directory of Professionals in Public History. So it uh, just means that I am recognized at a level that I get to speak with third graders and tell them about their local history. So um, <laughs> I enjoy doing that. I really do. And um, adults, too. And adults, of course, of course. <laughs> uh, next. I have several friends that are elementary school teachers, and, and so I always get roped into that. And, and I think I got to the point where I can predict most of the questions that you guys will ask, but those kids always surprise me. There's just stuff out of the field. So. <laughs> Feel free to try to surprise me today. Um, so, uh, yeah, a little bit about me. I've lived in San Diego for 20 years, um, um, all around Balboa Park in those old, uh, old neighborhoods that were mostly built in the, in the early 1900s. Um, I locally educated. Uh, I, uh, I studied archaeology at San Diego City College, uh, GIS, uh, computer mapping at Mesa College, uh, degrees in history and archaeology at, at University of California, San Diego, and my MA studying under Dr. Seth Malios uh, at San Diego State in historic archaeology. Uh, and I've been 
doing archaeology for uh, coming on 12 years in Southern California uh, and Nevada and Arizona. Uh, so I spent a lot of time out in the deserts there. Um, 10 years ago, it was mostly um, solar farm surveys. Uh, now it's mostly construction monitoring for putting in power lines and that kind of thing. Uh, there's my family tree. So, part of why uh, I was asked to come speak today is because my book came out a few months ago, uh, Images of Rails, San Diego Colleagues by Arcadia Publishing. Uh, I, I'll have some for sale afterwards with a, 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 a historic, historical society discount today. Uh, they're over on the table there. Um, but if I didn't bring it up, or if you want to pick it up later, uh, it's available at local border stores, the, the one down in, um, uh, just down the way, uh, on the other side of Miramar, uh, the Rail Association Museum down in National City, and a few independent bookstores around the town. Uh, online, of course, at Amazon Arcadia. The image on the cover here is, uh, uh, downtown at 3rd and Broadway, downtown San Diego, uh, and that is the, um, uh, the electric interurban train to National City. Um, and uh, so those were kind of the long distance trains that ran one community to another. Uh, and this is about 1915 there, so. Um, okay, next. So the, the story of San Diego streetcars begins with the horse-drawn uh, horse streetcars. Um, and uh, next, and that story really begins uh, with Elisha Babcock and Hampton story. Um, Babcock came, like many San Diegans, came out from the Midwest, from Indiana in particular, uh, in uh, in in the 1880s, late 1870s, early 1880s, and in, in fairly quickly bought the Coronado Peninsula uh, in 1885 and began developing that. Um, he set up a, a residential housing lot, subdivided, um, and uh, established a ferry uh, to run from downtown San Diego across. Um, divided the area into lots in 1886 and started building a Hotel Del Coronado, which you can see under construction on the right there, uh, in March of 1887. Uh, next. And his, uh, his main challenge was how to get people over to the Hotel Del Coronado. Uh, to, and to look at those lots to buy. So what he did, he laid some rail from the ferry landing, which is still in the same location today, uh, if you take the ferry across to Coronado, and ran those tracks down to Coronado, or sorry, sorry to the Hotel Del Coronado. Uh, and, uh, and had, uh, and, and ordered and had built um, several horse-drawn streetcars. Uh, the photo on the top right is one of the original cars that has been restored and is in a private collection up in Orange County. I have not been able to get up and see it. They aren't showing it to the public, they just got it in their backyard. Oh. Um, so, yeah, kind of a loss, I think. I, I would love to go see that. It is the last one um, that, uh, that we're aware of. And it's been, it was fully restored about 20 years ago. And it's gorgeous in the photo. Oh. Um, also, near the ferry landing, they built the stables um, to house all of the, uh, the, the feed and, and the blacksmith shops and, and all of the, uh, the horses for. Uh, for running uh, the streetcar line. Next, uh, service and service began on that in July of 1886. Uh, it wasn't just on Coronado. Uh, on the uh, on the San Diego side, uh, they installed something similar. Uh, the 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 tracks ran from the uh, Pacific Coast Steamship Wharf uh, at the uh, at the foot of uh, Fourth Fifth that area down there. Um, the steamship work was where most people arrived in San Diego back then before the railroad came. So, um, so all of these, uh, so Alonzo Horton arrived uh, there, um, and, and many of San Diego's founders and early residents all came in um, by, by steamship from San Francisco uh, or by clipper ship around the Horn, and, and that steamship work is where they would have arrived. That photo here uh, is from 1890, and you can tell because we've already got electricity. Uh, with the light pole here, the gas lights. Uh, so it's a little bit later. Next. From the wharf, the, run up, the line ran down Market Street, uh, which was the main business district at the time, uh, all the way up to Fifth. Uh, yeah, up, sorry. Yeah, this, this photo is from Fifth Street in 1886. Again, you can see the electricity. These masts right here were about 150 feet high and were arc lamps that lit the whole area up, just kind of a bright white blue. Um, 
A lot of people didn't like the harsh glare, but it did allow shops to stay open later and people to wander around town um, and, and the evening hours, which was uh, really uncommon before that. So, um, this building is still here, and I believe this one is also, but those are about the only recognizable things in the gas tank district now. So. What street would they be on now? So that is Fifth, um, and I believe it is looking um, north. Let's see. Uh, this is probably looking south from about Broadway down Fifth mm -hmm. towards Market. Yeah, I'd have to I'd have to pull those two buildings up to get a placement, but I think that is looking south. Uh, so back down towards the wharf down here. Mm -hmm. There were only about four or five of these tall mast poles, so if they, those help us identify the location. So uh, once we pull out the historic map, that's so. that thing on the left, there, that that horizontal. Yeah, look this, at that. Yeah. So those are those are probably uh, uh, either telegraph or electrical wire. Probably telegraph at this era. Um, yeah, so you've actually got, over on the rack here, this is a glass insulator. So uh, on, on top of those, you can see those little dots. That's what, that's what these are. So the wires went in, fed around a little wooden post underneath the glass insulator so that the electricity wouldn't pop out and shock someone. Uh, so no, it's because of the photograph. It just doesn't show up. Yeah. So this thing was just packed full of wires. So, yeah. Okay, next. So from there, uh, the, the line ran up Fifth and then turned uh, turned west on Broadway. Uh, this is Broadway, uh, looking west from Fifth Street, uh, in uh, yeah mm -hmm. uh, the mid 1880s. Under construction there on the right is the first Methodist church, uh, which was the largest church in San Diego at the time. It could seat 2,000. Um, we've also got some early advertisements for the development of University Heights, um, which was just taking off at the time. And again, in the background, we've got another one of those masts, which would have been down near uh, where today's Pacific Highway is, or Kettner Street, somewhere around there. So, mm -hmm. those scattered around town. Do you know what the cost of variety on the Tulkter was? On the I don't. At most, it would have been nickel. Um, uh, yeah, a few years later, uh, it was a nickel. But I haven't seen anything specifically on the cost of these. But that would have been the max, for sure. So. Yeah. Uh, so the, the, the line essentially did a loop. So it left from the wharf and it went up, um, up past market, the business district, up through today's gas lamp, and then kind of moved back around. So, uh, there were small spur lines that ran out towards Golden Hill, down, uh, down Broadway or down Market, uh, but that was pretty much the whole coverage area was just that downtown floor at the time. So, um, okay, next. Uh, with the electricity came in in 1881, as we saw with those poles there, and so um, uh, the, the arc lamps and the carbon lamps, but, uh, but pretty early, next, uh, we had some people experimenting with um, using electric power for, uh, for streetcars. Um, and a gentleman named George Copeland, who was involved with the flume system to bring water into San Diego, <coughs> was one of the early experimenters. Uh, and he, he made an agreement with uh, uh, a steam railroad company that had a line from, uh, from the foot of Broadway uh, that ran up Ketner to Old Town. And he had an agreement with him to, to borrow his track to test out some electric trolleys. Uh, this is one of the early ones. Uh, they, they did the original testing in November of 1887, and it was successful, and it was the first electric trolley on the West Coast. Yeah, San Diego first. Uh, a month or so later, they wound up, once the tests were successful, they moved the, they, they took down all the poles, all the wires, and moved everything over to 4th Avenue for a permanent, uh, permanent installation. Uh, and so, um, yeah, that photo, the photo right here is from 1889, uh, somewhere in uptown, so the Bankers Hill, the Hillcrest area. Um, this might be a good time to define terms as well. I, I'm using words like streetcar and trolley, and they're not quite the same. A streetcar is a pretty generic term that is a, a lightweight vehicle that, that runs on the rail. Um, a trolley specifically is electric power, and the reason they call it that is because at the top of this wire here uh, is usually a little two-wheel device that runs across the wires and then transfers that electricity down to the motors. 
Um, and that little carriage up there trolls along the wire. Mm -hmm. So the trolley. So there you go. Um, and we'll see some better photos of that going ahead. Most nowadays are replaced by a rigid pole instead of uh, just a dangling <coughs> wire. Um, but the same concept with a little carriage that runs across, and that's what a trolley is. So trolleys are all electric, but streetcars can be propelled by any, you know, either horses or or uh, or gas or electric or any other mm. motor device. So yeah. Uh, next, thank you. So they tore down the wires and poles, moved everything over to the port uh, on the south end. Then the uh, again the connection point was that Pacific Coast Steamship Wharf because uh, that was still where all of the people and most of the freight were coming into San Diego. Uh, and from there, the line ran north up to University Heights. Service started on December 31st, 1887. Uh, this picture is on 4th uh, Avenue near Quince, um, up in um, you know, that Bankers Hill Hillcrest area. Um, and we've got a couple things going on here. We have, we've got one wire coming down we have a couple of extra cars that are unpowered, that are just for holding extra people. Um, so I think we've got two cars that are actually powered that have engines. Um, so they managed to get a pretty decent amount of power out of those things. The carriages were pretty light, but by the time you load that up with you know 60 or 80 people, that's mm -hmm. pulling quite a bit of weight to head up that, that grade from downtown up to, uh, to University Heights. Um, we have found part of the, uh, the rail system for this. The original line um, down on Kettner, where all the testing was done, uh, there is a San Diego Gas and Electric power station at, um, at Kettner and Vine Street that's undergoing some upgrades right now. And just in the last month or two, they've uncovered some of this rail down there uh, from the original, the, that, that um, uh, Old Town Steam Railroad where the electric was first tested. So, pretty cool stuff. Okay, next. What was the speed? At best, four or five miles an hour, probably more like three. Um, they were they were generally faster than the horses. The way the horse-drawn routes had to run was for the flat areas downtown, they had a team of two. But when they came to that grade that we just saw that reds north up fourth, fifth, and sixth, you know, past the park, they hooked on a third horse um, to make it up that grade. Um, the electrics, um, the reason they took so long to get going was because they really couldn't handle any kind of grade. So by the time they got this thing working and to a point where you can have the, the four of those, um, they were running probably four or five. Later on, I'll get to some cars that I know were running eight to ten miles an hour, so I'm pretty certain these were a bit slower because uh, they made a point of bragging about how fast the new ones were. So um, four to five miles an hour top, so it's more just a convenience than a, than a fast system. So, yeah. Uh, and the, uh, uh, the Electric Rapid Transit, which was the name of Copeland's line, uh, ran, uh, ran past the Florence Hotel, which was built uh, up on the hill at 1st Street uh, between 3rd um, uh, and 4th. Today, this is where the new Sharp Reese Steely Hospital is, if you guys know Bankers Hill at all. Um, the, the main southern entrance is, is right here for Sharp Reese Steely. Uh, also, if you go by Sharp Reese Steely, on the back side, there's a, uh, um, there's a large Morton Bay fig tree that is marked as a San Diego historical point of interest. Uh, along with this one and several, these two and several others, they were planted with the opening of the Florence Hotel here. Uh, and the, uh, I did some of the archaeology for that project uh, when they were building the Shockery Steely, and they had to design around that Morton Bay fig tree. So the, the hospital has a very strange front entrance and parking garage entrance that kind of loops around the side of that tree and jogs in. And it's, <laughs> it's a pain to drive. It's a real, a real annoyance, but when you realize why they had to do it that way, they, they saved that tree. It's pretty cool. So, um, the, uh, this picture is from 1888, shortly after, uh, a couple of years after the hotel opened. They had already done really well and added an extra wing. Um, but uh, so that, that tree was planted in. Um, yeah, early 1880s, so it's pretty cool. Um, but the line didn't last long. Uh, there were, there were, the biggest problem was kids loved to throw rocks at the electric wires because they would spark like crazy, <laughs> and it was a lot of fun. 
What happened though is that led to huge maintenance costs. They were always going down. The whole system would shut down for days or weeks at a time while they went out and repaired this stuff. Uh, there was also a lawsuit with San Diego Gas and Electric over uh, they you know they didn't they didn't share electrical wires and poles and and uh, uh, so by the time this thing got through the courts, Electric Rapid Transit had lost the lawsuit, uh, and that combined with the uh, uh, with the excessive maintenance costs because of the kids and the rocks, uh, the line the line shut down. Um, in about, I think it was 1889. Um, but Copeland uh, had other plans. Uh, next. How many people know San Diego had cable cars? No one. Oh, one. Cool. Uh, San Diego was fourth in the West behind um, uh, LA, Oakland, and, uh, and San Francisco for the cable car system. Next. So Copeland, uh, who still owned all of the trackage and rights to the, uh, the electric rapid transit, along with uh, Mr. Fisher, uh, who was involved in, uh, uh, who was the owner of the Florence Hotel that we just saw, and was also the developer of the Fisher Opera House downtown, um, that uh, was down in the gas lamp, got together and, um, and decided to start a cable, cable company, a cable car company, the San Diego Cable Railway. Uh, they used the existing track from the ERT, so it ran on the same, same segments. Uh, and they built this power station uh, on 4th and Spruce, so kind of between Bankers Hill and Hillcrest area. Uh, and on the main floor was the car shop. Upstairs were offices. Um, this is a photo from, uh, from 1890. The, uh, the building is long gone. There's now an architect's office on that corner. I went inside there because I, I heard that they had something related to the trial. If you go upstairs in the architect's office to the third floor, they've got some of these historic photos hanging in the lobby. But new architects occupy that space than, than used to, and so if you ask them what's up with all the historic photos, they have no clue at all. They don't know where they are. They have no idea that, that they are on the location of the old cable car building. But um, I like to go bother people like that. So I guess they know now. <laughs> but they didn't a few months ago. Uh, so, uh, next. And then the basement was the, uh, was the power equipment. So uh, the main wheel here, the black one that you can see in the background, was 25 feet in diameter. Um, the, uh, the cable was about one and an eighth inches thick. And they had two different sets of cable that were five miles long each. One of them powered the, uh, the town section. So from Fourth and Spruce down to the uh, to the wharf, the other one powered the Mesa section, uh, which ran from Fourth and Spruce up through University uh, through Hillcrest and University Heights. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> the town section ran at eight miles an hour. The Mesa section was the high speed section that ran at ten miles an hour. So those <laughs> kind of cooked along um, and uh, and scared all the horses as they went. <laughs> Next, the cars were beautiful. Uh, they were all named instead of having numbers like we see on buses and trolleys now. So that's the Las Pinas Um They were maroon and gray with gold lettering. They had uh, stained glass clerestory windows on the top. The, uh, the gentleman here with his foot up on the running board is Frank Van Vleck. He was the engineer and designer of the trolley cars. So we have him to thank for how beautiful those look. Uh, that photo is from 1890 or 1891, um, right around the grand opening. Uh, next. At the north end of the line, um, it was very common for transit systems in the, of the day to create some kind of facility at the end of the line to encourage ridership and get people to, to spend their nickel to, to, to ride the trolley. So uh, this is the pavilion of the bluffs, uh, which is uh, where it's up in, in um, University Heights, where today's um, uh, Charlie Barn Park is. Uh, it's right next to that, so this is what it was originally built for. Uh, this is the, the grand opening in September of 1890. In the pavilion, they had indoor concerts and dancing. Uh, they had free orchestras on Sundays. Outside, they had walking trails, picnic grounds, that type of thing. Uh, later, they added a merry-go-round, um, a shooting gallery, and a lot of other kind of carnival types of things. So this is right on the bluff. Mission Valley would be just behind the, uh, the structure on the right um, with the, 
yeah, the old mission, uh, El Presidio, uh, down this way. So, uh, yeah. Okay, next. None of that exists. Not anymore, no. Um, I'll, I'll see some more photos later of how it developed, but, uh, but yeah, that's, that's all gone now. Uh, now a park and, and housing, so mm -hmm. like most of the stuff. Um, mm -hmm. Charlie Barn Park is still there, but that's kind of based on a later development, so. Uh, on the downtown route, um, so the, uh, this is a photo of 6th and Market from 1891 uh, with the cable car running down there. Uh, the, uh, the cable car company had some financial difficulties as well. Um, again, maintenance was much higher than either they predicted or they said they predicted, hard to tell which. Um, uh, but most of the funding was coming from uh, the California National Bank, which is a new bank set up at the end of the, uh, the land boom in the 1880s. And it turned out that one of the managers and one of the board, the, the members of the board of directors were uh, embezzling uh, like crazy from the bank. Um, they, uh, they finally got caught. One of them was in Europe at the time, traveling on all of his stolen money, and just never came back. Um, there are some really fun articles in the newspaper uh, about spotting him in Cairo or in Budapest, you know, uh, and stuff like that. But he was never seen in San Diego again. Um, the other guy that got caught uh, wound up hanging himself in the Brewster Hotel downtown. So quite the scandal at the time. But what that meant was that the cable railroad never got a lot of the money that they were promised. Um, they, had, uh, they had new schools of cable waiting on the dock and had no way to pay for them, and they essentially just went out of business. Uh, and that would have been, uh, so they, November of 1891 was the, uh, uh, was when the bank went under. The, the cable car line hung on for about another nine months, but then went under. So they were really only active for about two and a half years. So. Yeah. <laughs> okay, next please. And so now we come to uh, the San Diego Electric Railway, which most people who do know about the trolleys are probably most familiar with. Next. And this is really the child of John D. Spreckles, that handsome devil on the left. Um, he arrived uh, uh, by a luxury yacht in San Diego Bay at the end of the land boom in, uh, in 1887, uh, came to resupply. His father had built a, a sugar empire uh, based out of San Francisco. Uh, have you heard of Sparkle Sugar? Yeah. yeah, still around when I was a kid, yeah. Um, so mainly uh, the raw material coming from Hawaii, but they also had huge shipping interests. And so um, uh, when, when John D. arrived uh, in San Diego, the, uh, the end of the land boom was starting to cause a lot of financial difficulties for guys like Babcock and Story who kind of extended themselves a little too far. Um, and the uh, the, the city founders were really worried that just the whole thing was going to collapse. And so when they saw a rich guy, John Spreckle, sailing in the bay, they say, hey, hello, uh, how would you like a few city contracts starting with a colon wharf? Um, and he looked around, he liked the weather. He, I think, I think it, to some degree at least, he said, I kind of want to get away from my dad up in San Francisco. And, and so, yeah, I like it here, I'll take you on. Uh, so the picture on the right is the Colin Wharf that, that he built shortly after. Um, this is fun. Uh, this photograph that came from the San Diego Historical Society was undated. Uh, and one of the cool things that us historians try to get to try to do is to try to figure out based on, you know, the stuff that we see in that photo of, of when that was taken. Uh, the cool thing here are the flags that you probably can't make out at this scale. But there are a certain number of stars on that flag. And every few years back then, that flag was changing. And so they helped me pin down the date. Um, 1897 is that photo, based on the number of stars. So um, pretty cool little side research project just to get that. So, um, but uh, Spreckles wound up not only taking on the city contract for that colon wharf, but also uh, was approached by Babcock to, uh, to buy in as a partner on some of his projects that were, that were, were struggling financially. Uh, and so very quickly, uh, Spreckles bought into the, uh, the, the lots on Coronado, the Hotel Dell, the ferry, the boathouse, the bathhouse, the ice factory, uh, the electric plant, and the Otai water flume coming in. And within a couple of years, John Spreckles and his brother uh, were pretty much running the whole show. So, next. So, 
uh, that, that empire that he had just bought into, that, that, that Babcock had put together, included the, um, uh, a few rail projects. The San Diego street cars, the horse drawn uh, cars that we saw at the beginning of the project. Uh, also the Coronado Railroad, which was a steam line that ran around the bay and up the Strand. And then also the Park Belt Motor Road, which, uh, which ran through City Heights. Uh, the Park Belt Motor Road is pretty cool. I think I might have some photos later, but it was a, a steam line that started at Golden Hill at the end where the, where the horse drawn cars ended. Uh, they, uh, they disconnected the horses. They hooked up a steam locomotive, and this line went up um, Switzer Canyon and out through City Heights and back down University, and then hooked back up to the horsepower line at around Fifth and University. Uh, so all of those are components of what Spreckles had just bought into. Uh, and so one of the first things he did was start to consolidate that. And so in November of 1891, he formed the San Diego Electric Railway Company with this super cool logo. Um, next. And he began to electrify the whole system. Uh, electricity had now been in San Diego for 10 years, and so there was a bit of an infrastructure. Um, but he had a new uh, uh, power plant built at Broadway and Kettner downtown um, with, the, with the huge uh, smokestack there. And they began to convert the entire horse car setup and all of the other little associated lines to electric service. Uh, the top right photo there is one of the work cars, so horse drawn, but it had a platform on the back that had a pulley system that could raise that platform up so that the workers could, uh, could work on connecting lines and wires and poles and all of that. So, uh, and so within five years, uh, by 1897, um, all of the horse car routes have been converted to electric service. And that totaled almost 17 miles of track, uh, mostly in the downtown area. Uh, so, and, and uptown a little bit. Next, and so the, the horse cars were phased out. Um, and they introduced new cars. Um, the, uh, the double decker cars that you see here, these were the first double decker cars in the West. Um, the photograph here is, uh, is opening day on September 21st, 1892, and it was a VIP run, so. Uh, I think Alonzo Horton is on that car somewhere. Kate Sessions is in there. Um, Fisher, who, uh, uh, who owned the Florence Hotel and the cable car line, uh, lots of others. This shot is from uh, Fifth and Market um, in, uh, down in the gas line. So that building is still there. I'm pretty sure it's Hooters. <laughs> Either that or it's, it's across the street at Barley Nash. So either way, they're serving liquor. And, you know, it's, it's the gas line. <laughs> uh, okay, next. And so they uh, they took a lot of the existing horse cars and converted them. This uh, this this so we now have the rigid trolley pole that you can see. Um, this was originally a horse-drawn streetcar that has now been boxed in. They've added windows on the side. Most of the horse-drawn cars were open-sided um, and had these canvas shapes that you could roll down to stop the dust when the streets were, were really dusty. Um, but, uh, but they glassed in some of the windows here and, and converted those. I love this photo. There's so much going on. Uh, and you've got the lady in her Victoria dress here. Um, you've got this guy is flying around that corner. Can you, can you see that? Yeah. And he's about to. So this Charlie is heading toward the wharf this way. So that's there's some bad business going on there. Um, <laughs> uh, looks dangerous. So yeah. So we're looking south uh, uh, towards the wharf now. Um, there's a car, a couple of cars on there too, right? Or no, all those all the horse drawn carriages. Oh, okay. Yeah, yep, we're a little early. Um, what about the, what about the uh, one that's a crossway so the horses that's open? No, 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 on, on the. Oh, here. Yeah. yeah. The, to me, that looks like um, uh, the back of a modern glass truck. So mm -hmm. they would have panes of glass. That's what I think that is. Um, so horse drawn freight, yeah. So horse drawn, but but what these are? So they have giant glass panels in here for installing windows. That's what it looks like to me. It's kind of an to look at. It is. There's yeah. Then again, if, if he's moving, you know, uh, yeah, slow enough. So yeah. Did the trolley? Who had the right of way? The trolley or the horses? <laughs> no. I mean, you know, <laughs> no. It was all. It was all chaos and it was all new, right? So. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah.
Good question. Good question. Yeah, yeah. can you survive and you didn't get arrested, I guess you have right of way, right? And so, yeah. um, there are some, some uh, in doing the research, a lot of this research for this book and some of my other projects was done out at the, um, uh, at the Rail Museum in Campo, the Pacific Southwest Railway Museum. And they have, um, uh, they have all of the records from the San Diego Electric Railway Association. Some, some more, a lot of photographs are held at the, the San Diego Electric Railway Association, the, 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 the Electric Trolley Museum down in National City. But, but they have a lot of, of, of all just document books full of, you know, documenting accidents and things like that. I've seen a lot of accident investigation photos involving the trolleys um, uh, going back to the 1920s and 30s. Um, and, uh, uh, so yeah, you can really dive deep into there. Um, uh, but yeah, I think at this period in the 1890s, everything was so new that uh, uh, there really weren't very many rules. There were no stoplights yet. That didn't come uh, until automobiles in uh, the 1910s. I don't know what year San Diego got the first. So uh, it got it got much worse once once automobiles arrived. So. Lights and stop signs. Stop lights. There were no lights until the mid 1910s. Did they have stop signs? Uh, sign? No. Generally, what they had, if it was bad enough, was they would have a, a, a police officer standing in the middle of the intersection with a whistle. Yeah. yeah. What about hours of operation? I haven't found many details on that. Um, the uh, at least locally. So, I mean, these were essentially commuter uh, systems, and so they were tied around business hours. You had, with the electric lights in 1881, you had an extended business hours and extended, you know, open hours. That was when a lot of stores would start staying open past sundown. So you had massive changes in the 1880s. So I don't know if it had quite settled down yet by 1891 or so. Mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, yeah, generally for, the idea was bringing people from the new residential developments in Uni University Heights and, and Bankers Hill and Golden Hill into downtown because that was pretty much where everyone worked. Um, there weren't a lot of like kind of small residential hubs in, in you know that core of San Diego that had much by way of work. You know, you might have your corner store or your market or that kind of thing, but there weren't a lot of jobs out in those suburbs. So everybody came down to downtown for for shopping and for work. Yeah. Could you tell me about what the population of San Diego was at that time? The, um, yeah, I probably have to check my notes to get some numbers, um, but you're, you're talking, I think at the height of the land boom, uh, which would have been 1887 or so, it had hit about just shy of 40,000, I think. But within the next couple of years, it dropped down to under 20,000 as all of those people left, so. Um, oh, wait, 140,000? No, 40,000 40, 40, down to about 16,000. Yeah. So by the time of this photo, it was starting to creep back up a little bit, um, partly based on, on the development of, of, of this system and, you know, allowing that to build out more neighborhoods. But yeah, the, the, the land boom in San Diego was really based around rumors of a transcontinental railroad connection. Um, we're kind of down here, tucked in the corner, and, and so um, the, uh, the railroad so, especially for business development, without a, a, a transcontinental railroad connection, a lot of people didn't want to invest in San Diego. And so there would be these rumors of, hey, so-and-so is going to build this line, it's going to happen. Mm -hmm. And then real estate, would, would, you know, would, prices would get inflated, investors would come in. It was mostly investors at that time. They would come in, try to swoop up a few lots, and then try to turn around and sell it to the, guy, the next guy that, you know, that came off the boat. Mm -hmm. And the prices just inflated and inflated. Um, and, and then there would be some announcement like, oh, no, railroad's not coming, and it would just collapse. And so we had a couple of those cycles based on the railroad stuff. What you'll see after this coming up is, is it, 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 it started to change and that the people came would bring their families and they were intended to stay. And so it wasn't so much the railroad speculation as it was families wanting to stay permanently. And that kind of ended that cycle of, of boom and bust. So. Where, where did the people that were leaving go? Uh, the, the, the next sucker market, you know, uh, we really uh, is, is what happened. Most of those were essentially speculators. So they were the same types of folks who came through the gold rush, you know. Um, they were interested in that rush cycle, you know. So we had this massive migration for the gold rush. 
Those were all get-rich-quick folks, right? So when there was no gold, they found something else. Same kind of thing with the real estate speculators. Oh, real estate. Mm -hmm. A little bit of both. Um, yeah, depending on the time frame you're talking about. So, yeah. mm -hmm. Okay, next. So over the next decades, Spreckles acquired um, several different failing um, transit lines and incorporated them into the San Diego Electric Railway. Um, there's a lot of these I haven't gone over, a bunch of smaller lines that it started up, but even, we even saw the early electric and the cable car lines that failed after two or three years, and that there were a lot of other systems that were really similar that just didn't last. And so Spreckles wound up buying up a lot of those um, <clears throat> the, uh, and incorporating them in the system. Uh, one of those was called the Citizens Traction uh, Company. And they had acquired the old cable cars. So that's why these look familiar. We've got the stained glass, you know, uh, in the class three windows and all. But they converted these to electric service from cable. So we've got now that trolley pole here. Um, and uh, this photo is up about 10th and University at the old ball field. Um, there used to be a baseball field up there with stadiums. And they used to have races there and all that. Um, and that's from 1896. Uh, Spreckles also picked up the South Park and East Side Railroad, the National City and Otai Railroad, the Point Loma Railroad, and so began uh, consolidating a lot of those, what were originally steam uh, passenger steam lines and converting them to electric service. Next. And what that all did was allow a, a, a larger uh, residential neighborhood development to spread out a little farther. Uh, Spreckles believed that if he built a line, that residential development would follow, mm -hmm. and then that everybody paying a nickel fare, because it was established by this time, a nickel was the fare, that he would make his money back um, on that nickel fare, everyone heading into the city and back every day. Mm -hmm. um, and he was, he was proven correct. Uh, next. So, Several, several neighborhoods developed at this time. Golden Hill, this, um, this shot is from Broadway and 21st in 1903. And I live just a few blocks from here. And many of those houses are still there. I'm um, mm -hmm. sure about that particular corner. But you can see Point Loma in the background up here. So, yeah, so facing, facing downtown. Um, Dirt Street. Pardon? Dirt Street. This is Broadway, and uh, so that's Broadway, and this is 21st. I mean, I'm not able to oh, yeah, yeah. Um, at best, they were laying in some sidewalks, as you can see, um, but those were real spotty. Well, as archaeologists love these areas because when, when that sidewalk was laid in, there's generally a, a little construction company stamp in the mm -hmm. corner, and so we can trace those. And, and most of them weren't, they weren't done a full block at a time, they were done a house at a time when the house was built or, or just ahead of the house. So, so every, every, every house or two will have some new concrete stamp in there with the local construction company's name and a date of like, you know, 1903 or 1912, so it's pretty cool. Uh, I've done, the city now considers those historic resources and so we have to record them when we're doing work there. I've done a big series of those in Hillcrest. Um, and on, I think, Exeter uh, Street up there in Vermont, somewhere in that area, I found uh, even uh, uh, large iron rings set in the curb, which were used for tying your horse on. So pretty cool stuff. There's a couple of them still left around, yeah. So uh, next, Normal Heights uh, was also another area developed around now. This is during, uh, so this is the real estate, this is the opening day of the neighborhood and the trolley extension. Uh, in 1907. Uh, this is on Adams Avenue near 40th. So this is about where Interstate 15 crosses Adams Avenue now. Mm -hmm. um, so they had a big festival in the tent. They were trying to sell real estate lots. Uh, and uh, they had some the new trolley cars uh, that came out there. It's, the photo's hard to tell, but I mean, you can see the mountains out here now, which if you're standing anywhere in normal heights, that's just not something we used to see in the, you know, in the background. It's all businesses. It's just a very busy, busy part of town. So. Uh, next. North Park uh, around this time also. This is 1907. That's the Georgia Street Bridge. This is University. Um, they're, they're redoing this now. Um, 
but originally it was a, uh, a redwood bridge. Um, this house is still here. I'm not sure about that one. But this gives you an idea of, of, what, um, of what North Park was like at the turn of this century. Um, there was nothing out here except a single farmhouse. They were growing some uh, lemons and I think walnuts out there. It was all basically a ranch. That was it. Um, this would be about where 25th or Texas is now. At the top of the hill, somewhere between Texas and 30th. Uh, they laid a single line of track in in 1907. They came back a little bit later and added a westbound track. Um, with this construction work that they're doing now, what, what happened is they, with the new Georgia Street Bridge, they, um, there is not enough clearance for buses to get through here. And so their plan is to lower this grade by about six feet. And so archaeologists had to come out and monitor while they're doing some utility work there. And we actually uncovered uh, both sets of tracks. So, um, I've got some photos of that later on. So mm -hmm. most of the stuff's still there. Uh, next. How am I doing on time? We have 10 minutes. Ooh. All right, let's go. All right, South Park. Uh, this is 28th and A. Looking north, Balboa Park on the left. All of these houses are still here. Um, they are amazingly expensive now, of course. <laughs> but uh, yeah, looking north on 28th and A Street. Um, this was one of the original double decker cars that by this time they had removed the upper deck. So that's part of the two, I think. Unfortunately, that was the last of the double deckers. They didn't last too long, they were a bit unwieldy. Um, and uh, so, next, um, like we saw with Mission Cliff Gardens, um, the the, uh, the San Diego Electric Railway also built some uh, some stuff at the end of the line. Next, uh, one of the things with the Lobanos Backhouse um, at Broadway and Kettner. You can see the steam, the, the, see the, the stack in the background. That's from the power station that we saw in an earlier slide. So the baths were heated by the uh, uh, by the, the, the power plant right behind it that ran the electric trolleys. This was designed by by Irving Gill, uh, the famous San Diego architect. Um, <clears throat> so they had heated pools, they had slides, they had rings, uh, all kinds of fun stuff. This photo is from 1900. Again, still still dirt. Still yeah. Street, right? Yeah. It's still uh, there. Okay, next. Yeah. It's still there. Another popular destination was Tent City in Coronado. So that's the Hotel yeah. Dell in the background there. Uh -huh. uh, the electric rock lines ran out there. Uh, the, the, the Coronado system was converted about the same time, maybe a little bit later than the downtown San Diego system. But eventually the line, the electric line ran from, um, from the ferry landing out to the Hotel Dell Coronado and south through Tent City. Uh, to connect to the steam line that still ran around the, uh, the south end of the bay. Uh, you could rent furnished tents and grass huts by the week. Um, some even had electricity. Although, so I don't see any. Yeah, I might see some connections here to the, uh, to the electric pole. Um, they, uh, they had a restaurant, a pool, a merry-go-round. Uh, when one of the older ferries was decommissioned, they basically pulled it up uh, on the inside on the bay side and turned it into a floating casino. So, all kinds of family fun. Uh, next, another destination was the, uh, the Panama California Exposition, the World's Fair uh, in San Diego, which was 1915 to 1916. Mm -hmm. They built a trolley station at the park. Um, this is now, this was destroyed by the 1960s, but um, uh, right around where this is, is where the large fountain is now, um, that's on the, uh, the east end of the Prado. Mm -hmm. So this is about where Park Boulevard is now. Um, and uh, they had 3.7 million visitors to the expo. Um, a lot of the people that came in those two years wound up coming back and, and staying in San Diego. Um, and, and moving into all that new residential development. Um, the, uh, the house that I lived in at Mission Hills uh, that you mentioned earlier, one of the, uh, the younger brother uh, who lived in that house uh, was, was a stone worker and plaster worker and had done some of the work on the Museum of Man. So that's a neat connection around there. Yeah, uh, fun stuff. Okay, next. And they built a lot of new trolley cars, especially for the expo service. Um, this is the, the class one cars. Uh, this shot is from Broadway in Fifth in 1913 with the bowler hats. I love that. And check her out. Yeah. <laughs> the ostrich feather hat. Yeah. It's gorgeous. Um, and uh, the makeup of sign the baseball grounds um, destination. Um, I don't know whether that was. There were some baseball fields at Tenth, uh, on Kettner, but then we also had that other set we saw earlier up on 10th. So um, I don't know 
where this one's going. Mm -hmm. Next, the class two cars. These were specially built for the expo. Uh, they had electric lighting, they had pull cords, uh, they had window shades that could pull down. Ooh. And you can see some of the ads in here. That's hard. There's ads for Crisco and Wrigley's gum. So, um, big national advertising to them around that time. Mm -hmm. Who owned those now? Who was the builder of those? Of uh, the cars? Yes. San Diego had their own trolley car shops that were down near that power station. So a lot of these were built there. Um, but there were two or three other companies around the country that were also building, that did nothing but build trolley cars. And so uh, depending on which exact series, it was a mix. Um, a lot of times the San Diego cars would be finished, repaired, painted, that kind of thing in the San Diego shops, but constructed elsewhere. Um, and it, yeah, and they went back and forth. The, um, the cable cars that we saw earlier, those were built by a tractor company in Stockton. Um, and so it depends on what year you're talking about. It was a new industry, and so there was a lot of back and forth. San Diego, after a while, decided it wasn't worth building their own. Right around this time, some of the last ones would have been built in 1910, and then they pretty much, by, by then, um, trolley manufacturing companies had got big enough that uh, they were doing a really good job with that, and so San Diego's shops quit building their own. That just looks very advanced. It does, yeah. <laughs> I, it was state of the art. Uh, but then there was real rapid development. And again, this is around the time when you had um, uh, Henry Ford's Model T, and so you had just the perfection of that assembly line system. And so you could start cranking these things out. Um, but the early stuff, all of those horse-drawn cars, all built by hand by carpenters, right? So you had a big changeover in a 20-year period. Um, uh, so. Next. Okay. Uh, and another thing that just isn't around anymore is a, a series of trestle bridges was built. Um, uh, so along Park Boulevard, after you know, north of the park that connected to the uh, the system up on University. Um, so this is Florida Canyon over here. I think about where Upas would go down. Um, so. Okay. Next. Boy, I'm just having fun yapping, we're missing stuff. Um, so then we're diving into the 20s. Um, in, uh, in 1922, eight, uh, um, Spreckles was, uh, was getting a little run down and wound up passing management on to his son, um, uh, Klaus Jr. And the first thing that Klaus did was he took a ride on the whole system. Um, and he, it was, it had become, uh, and it really just fallen into disrepair. The, um, there were some arguments between the railroad and the city of who's going to pay for street upgrades and things like that. And so the kind of repair had kind of come to a standstill. Um, the cars, even though they looked advanced, have been pretty worn out uh, you know, uh, during the fair and had kind of, they weren't new and modern anymore. And so he mentioned how bad that ride hurt his butt, and he determined <laughs> to fix the whole system. So next, uh, and uh, okay, cool. Was it the, this is the interesting stuff anyway. So they went through a system-wide upgrade. They replaced all the old redwood ties with uh, with concrete ties and new rail all over. This is 25th and Broadway in 1924. Um, they added the, 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 the big dream was to extend the line to La Jolla, and that's what happened in the 1920s, oh. with stops along the way. So this is what's now Belmont Park, um, and so that, the, uh, that's opening day there um, in, uh, in 1924, and you could take the electric trolley from Horton Plaza downtown all the way to La Jolla uh, in about 35 minutes at that time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, the terminal station was at Bay Street um, up in La Jolla. Next. A lot, a lot of open space. Right, that's all it was, yeah. Uh, not a hundred stoplights to slow you down. So maximum extent, uh, uh, we had 107 miles of rail. So each of these little lines that you see on here is part of, is a rail, rail, part of the rail system. Uh, and again, going all the way up um, to La Jolla. Um, but uh, you... Uh, <coughs> But we started seeing some conversion by, uh, by buses. Um, it was expensive to change routes and lay new rail. Uh, but with a bus, all you had to do was 
turn the steering wheel and create a new route. Right? So what wound up happening was routes that had become, as, as the neighborhoods grew and filled in in different, in different areas, some routes became less popular and so those were replaced with buses and they just quit running the trolleys out there to save money. Um, next, one of the first was the Old Town Route. Um, so, John D. Spreckles passed away in 1926. Shortly after that, his son was forced out by management and, uh, and parts of the company began being sold off. Next. Um, Along with uh, just uh, the general depression era uh, reduction in ridership, um, huge parts of the system began either just being shut down or converted entirely to buses. Mm -hmm. But nationwide, one of the issues at this time was, um, uh, was uncomfortable cars. And so the, uh, the President's Conference Committee got together, a bunch of railway owners across the country, and designed these cool new cars. Um, this is up on Adams in 1937 or 1938. Um, and in one of those new cars, the PCC cars. Next. Let's just scoot through here. Um, so we had a dip in ridership in the 30s, but when the war started, everything got crazy. We had so much war industry here that they brought back a lot of these old cars from service that had been retired in the 1910s, and they started pulling in cars from other neighborhoods all across the country. Um, and they set up new lines. This one, uh, you can... This is one of the parts plant specials. There's a sign here advertising work for women at the parts plant. So um, Convair and other aircraft manufacturers and all that. So we had new lines that, that ran out to those manufacturing plants. Next. I love this shot through the window. This is on Broadway um, during or just after the war. Um, but uh, they wound up um, pulling in cars from Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, from Salt Lake City, um, old subway cars from New York, uh, New York City. This is Fifth and Broadway here. Next. Um, VJ Day. Um, you can, uh, in 1945, you can actually see a lot of different types of cars here. So um, some of the, 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 the beat up old subway cars from New York, um, some of the newer San Diego cars here. Um, and, yeah. uh, so, again, after the war, population dropped, we didn't have all that manufacturing anymore, uh, and so the, uh, the company that owned the railway then did a big transit survey, and the results of that came back saying, look, we need to shut down about a third of this at least, it's just not paying for itself. Um, and uh, next, and they wound up shutting down the entire system and bringing in buses instead. Uh, this is the final run on uh, uh, April 23rd, 1949. The, uh, the last trolley led a parade of these new buses. Oh. Uh, so, yeah. So San Diego, we go from having the, the first electric trolleys in the West to really being the first city to convert entirely to buses. So, um, uh, next. A couple minutes, okay, I can cycle through this quick. Okay, next. So what happened to all these cars, all these tracks, all this rail? Next. Next. Um, a lot of them were sold for scrap. Um, I know, it's sad, it's a depressing photo. Um, some of them, uh, next. Some were converted to houses. Um, this is actually during the, during the 20s or 30s. This is over at Bankers Hill on Laurel. Um, converted into these apartments. Um, especially during the war, you know, when they were the oldest cars because they had a housing crisis, right? I wish these were still there. I'd still love to live in one of those. Yeah. Super cool. Next. Um, and some were restored. Car 54, which you can now see in this shed down at the, uh, the Rail Museum in National City, was originally two cable cars that were spliced together to make a larger car. Um, and then renumbered car 54 uh, and for a lot of years. So you can still see where those clerestory windows were, right? But this is much longer than the early trolley cars. So. Um, next. Uh, some are put back into service. Um, here in San Diego, we, we have the Silver Line that runs a downtown loop. Uh, these are not original San Diego cars. These are those President's Conference Committee cars uh, from the 1930s and 40s. Some of them pulled in from San Francisco or Seattle, um, but you can go ride those now. If you head up to uh, the, uh, um, the Rail Museum in Paris, uh, California, mm -hmm. they actually have two of the original San Diego PCC cars, uh, and they are in service up there. You can go ride them on their little, little uh, rail network. Next. And so, 
uh, a lot of the, the rail, basically what happened in the late 1940s was uh, some of the rail was pulled up and sold for scrap, but a lot of it, it just didn't make sense to go through that effort and they just laid asphalt over it. Uh, and so now we do work around the city. This is in Golden Hill at 28th and A Street, I think, 28th and B maybe. Um, and uh, we're uncovering the old trolley rails as we do um, utility work. All around the city, they're undergrounding all of these utility lines now. And so when we dig the trenches for that, we come across the trolley line. This is up near 4th and Quince. That's one of the old trolley yokes and part of the old trolley cable that they found during a sewer underground project about 10 or 15 years ago. Next. Georgia Street Bridge, where they're doing the work now. So we've uncovered the, uh, uh, the 1914 line and then the line that was upgraded in 1923 or 24. And the coolest thing was we found this brick line section of rail uh, at the Park Boulevard end that we really were not expecting. And this was the, the trolley wheel used to run through this little area here, and it was just decoratively lined with bricks. We had no idea that was there. Super cool stuff. Um, so that's a cross section of our archaeological illustrations that show how it worked. Next. Okay, cool, we made it to the end. <laughs> so, uh, sorry for rushing through there. Um, Questions, yeah. Did, did the automotive lines buy up the right of way for the trolley lines? No, well. Because the buses like took over everything. Yeah, so so it, you'll hear about this with Los Angeles a lot, especially about this conspiracy with Goodyear and the rubber yeah, yeah, and all yeah, of that, and the buses yeah. and all that stuff. And so I looked into that. There are there were actually some legal court cases in Los Angeles, and there was a bit of conspiracy out there. It was more of a more of a kind of price fixing kind of thing. Um, uh, I don't think the people involved really cared what happened to the trolley. They just wanted to line their pockets, right? I don't see that down in San Diego. Um, <clears throat> it doesn't look like that kind of thing happened here. What it really was was the changing demographic patterns after the war and, and the way, you know, neighborhoods. Remember before we had everybody coming into downtown to work, you know, we had a, we had a different kind of residential alignment after that with these little pocket neighborhoods that had, you know, that a lot of, of, of work and shopping within them. And so you have massively changing, you know, demographics and, and, and population movements. And so, and it was easy to build a rail line out across an empty mesa, like in that North Park photo we saw where there was nothing but an orange grove, right? By the time you're in the 1940s, late 1940s, 50s, if you want to put a new rail line in, well, you've got to knock down dozens, if not hundreds, of houses and all that expense, and rail is expensive to lay. Whereas you've got cheap gas and this auto bus, and you can just turn that steering wheel and make a new route. So I think it was completely, you know, demographic and economic. I don't see any of that Goodyear conspiracy down here. So. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Uh, as I remember from reading about the red cars. Yeah. And uh, and. The the suit that they filed against uh, Chevron, uh, Goodyear, and uh, and General Motors. Yeah. Uh, the red cars, uh, Pacific Electric, was represented by Joseph Aliota. Oh, wow. Well, uh, later mayor of San Francisco. Yeah. 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 Anyone else? Yeah. Actually, I see a parallel when you talk about communities developing with their own work. There was a, an example with Rancho Bernardo it was designed supposed to be designed as a place where people could live and work. So yeah. the original plan included an industrial park for employees you know, cool. for people to work. So that's kind of what time frame was that design and rolled out, do you know, ballpark? Well the 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 plan was unveiled in sixty one. Sixty one was when they okay. petitioned the city of San Diego for yeah. the annexation. Okay, plan. cool. And it included that. Yeah, it's pretty neat. We start to see that kind of thing in the nineteen tens, um, the progressive era. Um, and and uh, and it's been a permanent part of kind of yeah considering at least how how you know how urban planning in general so yeah pretty cool yes so from your, an archaeologist's perspective when they're doing some of this renovation or changing things yeah you already have a good idea of where these things are this is there about a, a bit of planning that goes into that before they start with the sawdust yeah yeah so uh, when because of the, the environmental laws, right, they've got to, you know, before they, they dig a trench, they've got to at least check and see if there's a likelihood of being anything, and that's why they hire us. And, and so we do a lot of this research ahead of time. Rail is easy because it's on maps, you know, so it's pretty easy to, and, and records and all that, so it's pretty easy to plot. So, yeah, I have, I have basically uh, uh, 
put all of the rail systems that I've been able to track down into a computer mapping system. And so, um, for instance, San Diego Gas and Electric just called me recently about a project they're going to be doing uh, near City College downtown. And so I'm able to pull up my maps and go, hey, you know what? This one's really cool because the only thing on that block was the horse-drawn car in the 1880s. Um, there was no electric system that would replace it later. And so I'm excited. In a couple of months, I'm going to get out of the and monitor those saw cuts and hopefully hit some, some of the, uh, the horse-drawn rail. So is there, is there an area where you're just waiting for some development to take place that you really want to get to? That's really it because we don't have, you know, we pull up a lot of rail because, you know, most of it is still buried here, but most of it is is newer rail, replacement rail, you know, right. especially right. post-1920. So that early stuff, that you want there it is. And down near City College, there, yeah, there is a stretch that, 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 that was basically, there are a couple sections that were abandoned during some of this consolidation process, mm -hmm. and those are the ones I want to see. And that's what this is coming up. So if we find any rail in there, I, I have no way of knowing whether that rail was pulled up or whether it was left in place, you know. Um, unlike the 1940s when you could just lay some asphalt across it, in, in the 1880s, it was a dirt road. It was going to be in the way, likely. So I have a feeling it was probably pulled up. Mm -hmm. But if it was left, that is the original horse car rail. We don't have any of that. None of that has been recovered anymore. So that's exciting. Yeah. I live at, uh, in the north part of uh, Pacific Beach. Okay. And back in our apartments there, there was a dirt road. And under that dirt road, someone discovered the rail lines were See? in there. It could still be under there. See, that's yeah. awesome. That's, a, that's why I was trying to tell you. Yeah, yeah. yeah you, and you had that. I told my daughter, I said, I remember that. She looked at me, I don't remember. Well, she was too little. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I think yeah. that's a back in the 60s. So the area where you find the rail with the brick lining, yes. do you just cover that up or do you have any, I've been in some cities where they preserve it and they put like a glass thing yeah, over it. Yeah, it, it depends. Um, and in, in that particular section, they're lowering that entire grade by six feet to make more clearance for buses and freight coming under there so we don't have that option in that place, in that location. Um, we pulled up uh, uh, some of the rail, a lot of the rail that like, in the Golden Hill picture, for instance, in order to get the utilities under there, they had to cut out a section, you know, so like a foot. So whenever I get any of that, I donate it to the Rail Museum down in the National City, and they put it on display. Some of it they slice thin and mount on little plaques that you can buy, and it raises money for the museum, that kind of thing. Um, uh, in that case, it's going to get blown out the whole thing. And so then I basically try to find someone who wants it, someone who's interested. Um, technically, the city owns it. And if they want to use it as an asset because it's recyclable and get 11 cents a ton for it or something, then that's their, it's their belongs to them, right? So, so it depends. Um, uh, sdg and &E, I have a good relationship with them uh, and the archaeologists over there. They know that I know a lot about this stuff, and so they tend to call me first, which gives me a chance to check my network and see if anybody wants it. But even the Rail Museum and National City, they're like, you brought us 900 pounds of yeah. like, <laughs> <laughs> right? so it's like, yeah, finding someone who both wants it and will do something useful yeah, with right. it, you know. Um, but sometimes I get it, you know. Yeah. Nobody wants this. It's it's you know it's worth 10 grand to the construction company, you know. Well, then that's where it goes, you know. I'm just hopeful that I get the call first so we can at least try to put something into play. Yeah. Sometimes we don't at all. Thank you. Yeah. When did the present day red trolley? So 1981, 1982, and that was an entirely different system that's running on some old freight lines, um, some similar locations, but really a, a different system, um, but yeah, uh, I've got some of that in the book, I go into that a little bit, um, uh, but yeah, really 1980s. What, what does the future of that look like? Is it ever going to expand? Or are we ever it's expanding that? right now. I've actually been working on a project as an archaeologist, the trolley expansion from Old Town to UCSD and UTC, so that's in construction right now. Uh, it's still going to be a couple yeah, more years till it opens, but yeah, yeah. If you're on I-5 up near UCSD, you'll spot that they're building big flyway bridges and all. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, we've been they've been working on that for about a year now, and there's probably another year or two to go. And then it's going to run it's going to run right through UCSD campus, and then elevated up down Genesee, down the median. Is that pretty wild. Wild. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that's an extension of the current red car trolley system down here. Yeah. yeah. Yes. I can remember in the 30s taking a streetcar across from Ocean Beach to Mission Beach on a bridge. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there was originally a Bayshore Railroad that used that bridge. When Spreckles bought that in, uh, uh, 
1901 or something like that. Or uh, that would have been the 19, late 1910s. Um, they wound up rebuilding that, you know, and converting it to the electric system. And then in the 1920s, you know, running it out there to uh, the new Belmont Park. Uh, so yeah, Mission Bay Amusement yeah. Center. Uh, in the book, I've got some photos of Belmont Park at the beginning. They've got a neat sign for 50 cents you could rent. A swimsuit, yeah. a locker, <laughs> and a sack lunch, you know, and, and, and a trolley fare from yeah. downtown yeah. to back. Yeah. 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 Super yeah. cool. Yeah. And, and just looking up on Wikipedia, talking about Pacific Electric, the yeah. Royal Red Cars right. in LA, uh, it says uh, it had more than a thousand miles of. Yeah, so right. in San Diego, based on population about that time, LA had about eight times the population of San Diego, and LA had about eight times the track mileage as the, uh, as the San Diego system. So if you're looking at population versus track miles, San Diego was the equivalent of Los Angeles' system, which was the largest in the world. Yeah, it was. And, uh, Oh, what LA wouldn't do for the red cars now. Yeah, right. Yeah. 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 Thank you all very much.